All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming to this KITP workshop and to the organizers for the kind invitation. It's really my pleasure and privilege to be here today and to have the chance to share with you recent results on this project uh, I started about two years ago and what they can help teach us about how to learn and cancel quantum noise in a real large-scale quantum processor. I thought we could start by having some uh, fun with it and making this a little bit more interactive and I'd, I would love to hear what you guys think is are the biggest challenges to quantum computing today. So either feel free to shout it out or maybe raise a, raise a hand. Noise? Say that again? Funding. Funding. <laughs> Any others? I sorry a problem that is good for that was mine that was yours and one more correlated noise. correlated noise all right thank you very much you guys are great so this echoes some of what you said right we have um, hardware developments correlated noise funding hype expectations material quality and in NISC and noise noise was the noisiest even here today among us and to me, first and foremost, noise is the biggest challenge to quantum computing. Noise causes errors. Errors corrupt experiments. Corrupted experiments are untrustworthy. These errors, therefore, limit the computational reach of modern quantum processors. Unfortunately, the story is that noise is unavoidable. You can't get rid of it. It's here to stay, even in classical computers. It can be suppressed, reduced, but never fully removed. So noise is here to stay. And so we better learn how to learn about noise and deal with noise. So what can you do to deal with noise? And broadly, the way I personally see it is that there's probably three broad categories. First, you can try to monitor your system. Errors occur. And post factum, you detect those errors, and then you can hopefully recover from them. And that's essentially quantum error correction. Now, this is very hard, and many people are working on it, but we're not quite there yet for large-scale systems. Perhaps the second way to think about it is that you could monitor your system. Coming back to what Michael just referred to, this experiment, you could try to, if you have the right setup, anticipate the errors before they even have a chance to manifest and intervene and prevent the errors from ever occurring. This is also a new idea, but it's also very difficult to do in experiments at the moment. And the third option is to not monitor the system, not detect the errors, and still try to do something. And that's where a lot of our NISC systems or noisy intermediate scale systems are at at the moment. And broadly, this is the field of error mitigation in which there's a tremendous amount of work at the moment and the focus of today's talk. So I'd like to take a little bit of inspiration by listening to music on my noise canceling headset. The noise canceling headset works by characterizing noise in the environment learning about that noise and using that knowledge to then tailor and inject special purpose noise into the system that can precisely cancel the noise of the system on average. So we could then ask, um, are there, is there potentially a way to introduce some kind of analogy to noise canceling headphones for quantum computers to yield a noise-free listening experience? And in this talk, having some fun with it and taking this analogy very loosely, I'd like to answer this in the affirmative. The high-level take-home messages before we dive into the talk itself are that, one, noise is here to stay. We, we can't get rid of it, but that's okay because, two, we can now begin to learn noise in a scalable, efficient, and accurate way so that we can use that knowledge to then cancel the noise and three, there's a no free lunch theorem. This doesn't come like a silver bullet. There is a cost associated with this that comes in the sampling overhead. 
So to give you a little bit more of an introduction to all this, I'd like to begin by introducing the general idea of, uh, of how to cancel noise and why it hasn't been possible to really do at scale until now experimentally. Due to the challenge associated with actually learning quantum noise, this is a quite a challenging problem, which we solve in a particular way in this talk. And so finally, I'd like to show you experimental results going from you know, 4, 10, 50, and thinking beyond number of qubits to then undo the noise in uh, Ising, in transverse fields, Ising more time evolution simulations on the quantum processor. So allow me to get everyone on the same page by starting with uh, the big ideas first. Imagine that uh, you have an idealized n-qubit quantum digital circuit. The circuit can be decomposed into a layered construction that looks something like this, comprising single qubit gates, followed by some entangling unitaries, for example, parallel C naughts. And these are then followed a number of steps until depth L, and there's finally a measurement at the end. Now, this is quite a general construction and very common, but not very realistic. In reality, what we have in real devices is that each gate is subjected to some noise, and then typically the noise is far larger in these entangling operations. So to keep things simple, let's just say that there is an associated noise channel, suppose lambda 1, that goes with unitary entangling gate U1. So necessarily and unavoidably, we have this kind of noise in our system. In general, this kind of noise uh, can be represented as a multi-qubit noise channel that is completely positive and trace preserving, represented by a very large, large, large 4 to the n by 4 to the n matrix. So if the noise is just the matrix, and I'm a theorist, let's say, why can't I just take the inverse of that matrix and simply imply the inverse operation? Now, of course, all the theorists in the room are probably jumping up and down in their heads and saying, no, 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 you can't do that. Why? Because the inverse of a completely positive trace-preserving map is, of course, an, a not a completely positive trace-preserving map. It's unphysical. It has negative eigenvalues. It's not a, di it's not a contraction. It's a dilation. It, the purity increases. You know, there's many reasons why this is something that you're not allowed to do, so to speak. Nonetheless, Let's say that maybe there is a way to do this, even though we don't keep track of the bath, we don't keep track of the measurement record. On average, however, we perhaps can do this, and this is where I'm very thankful to and lucky to have great colleagues like Kristen Temes, Sergey Bravi, and Jay Gambetta, who proposed a beautiful theoretical idea. They suggested that in principle, you can implement this inverse on average by introducing a new method known as probabilistic error cancellation. Because this is quite central to the idea of this talk, allow me to introduce it to you on a toy model. Imagine a circuit comprising one qubit, one gate, and one measurement. Of course, in reality, that gate suffers from some noise, lambda uh, one. To keep things simple, uh, let's make the target gate a simple identity operations. And for the noise, Let's just say that its effect is to randomly cause a bit flip error with some probability p. So in other words, with probability p, we apply the x gate. And with probability 1 minus p, we randomly just don't do anything or apply the identity gate as the environment. The average evolution of uh, these two quantum trajectories is then given by the average noise channel lambda, which is a, a bit flip channel and looks like this. So visually, what does this actually do and mean? Of course, the noise-free states live on the qubit block sphere and the very surface of it. And the noise itself, this channel lambda, then contracts all of the states towards the middle of it. And this contraction results in loss of information. It's reduced purity, and it corresponds to these positive eigenvalues. On the other hand, if we now want to implement the inverse noise map, we have to do the inverse, which is a dilation of the block sphere, which also results in information gain, increased purity, and therefore has to have these negative eigenvalues. So that's not 
in itself typically realizable, but let's just say that we play the game and continue by saying, what could the noise inverse be? For a bit flip channel, that's quite easy to say because there's only identity in X gates, therefore the inverse itself must have only identity in X gates. So I can take an ansatz where I assume that I have a decomposition of the inverse noise map into trajectories where I sample the identity and trajectories where I sample the X gate with some probability Q, which is yet to be determined. If we look at the unraveling of this total circuit into trajectories where we both try to intervene and the noise acts, and we can't resolve the two types because we are not monitoring the system, then with probability one minus Q, one minus P, no error occurs and we don't do anything. With probabilities one minus Q, P and the complementary one, an error occurs because either the noise acted or we tried to correct the noise However, the noise didn't do an error, so we introduced a noise uh, process into the channel. And finally, with some probability Q times P, we're able to precisely undo the noise when we want to. Now, if we had a monitor system, we would just focus on the two green trajectories and ignore the middle ones. But we're not monitoring the system, so we can't do that. So what can we do instead? Well, imagine you try an interference where you interfere the middle two trajectories in such a way that they precisely cancel and the outward two trajectories in such a way that they precisely constructively add up so that their probability is unity. So on average, then you would cancel the noise and you would then have a noise-free, uh, you would then have a, a, a ideal circuit. The solution to that construction is to find that this probability Q has to be negative, the initial probability, normalized by one minus twice the probability. So you notice this is a very strange probability. It's not a probability, of course, because it's negative, first of all. And then it also blows up all the way to minus infinity in the case that the bit flip happens with probability one half. In other words, the information is no longer recoverable. The matrix is singular. But otherwise, you have this, this Q. So you can take this simple idea and use it to actually implement this in physical quantum hardware by looking at a normalization. So taking this um, sum over real coefficients and turning it into a quasi-probability distribution. You can define a normalization factor of gamma, which is somehow related to cross-entropy benchmarking. The sampling overhead uh, you can define as the L1 norm of the vector of probabilities of the initial channel. It grows as a function of the noise. It's one when the noise is absent. And then you can define trajectories that you can actually implement in the following way, where with probability P sub i, defined in this way, you sample a trajectory where you apply the identity gate, and then in the measurement you undo the sign of this trajectory, or you add, sorry, the sign of this trajectory in this way in post-processing. And in a trajectory where you want to sample the X gate, you classically essentially weigh your outcomes by a minus sign given by the sign of this value Q. So this is how you can ravel quantum trajectories from a quasi-probability distribution as opposed to a normal distribution. And so some of the rules we know about quantum trajectories no longer quite hold. For instance, the variance of these things, as we'll see, will grow. Why would you do this? The significance is that this way, by raveling quantum trajectories in this way, without knowing the noise, you can mitigate, you can completely undo the noise. And that's by, uh, and this way, by doing this construction, you can find an unbiased, noise-free estimator of the mean expectation value of any observable. That's the gain. The cost is that because of this sign problem, let's call it, the variance will grow of this. So you have to sample more shots. But it's not so bad. Maybe, let me just take a quick one second and just check in if there's any burning question or clarification. Uh, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll repeat it, it's okay. So how, how does the overhead for this compare with something yeah, the question is, how does the overhead for this compare to something more simple like post-selection? Well, I'm not sure how you would do post-selection in general, 
Um, the overhead here, as you see, grows with gamma squared, and that will be the last part of the talk to talk about the overhead. But you can really do this in an arbitrary general quantum circuit. So I think it's a, it's a broader context. Great. Okay, so to summarize the basic idea, it's that you can ravel quantum trajectories uh, to undo the noise by using these quasi-probability distributions. Uh, but the key ingredient in all of this is that you have to know what the noise is. So it works at a high level like these noise-canceling headphones where you inject noise to cancel noise. If you want a slightly more physical motivation in terms of uh, random walks, you could think of the, you could take the familiar picture of a drunkard under a lamppost that takes a, a step either to the right or to the left with some probability p. The ensemble evolution of the drunkard is a Gaussian that with time has a bias, a probability bias, it drifts to one side, and because of the diffusion, it also broadens and grows. So the way you can then cancel this bias, the way that probabilistic error cancellation works, is essentially by adding a second random process, like the wind blowing with some random probability, let's call it Q, a bias that is precisely biased to oppose the first random probability. So on average, you have two diffusive processes, the first one cancels the bias of the second one um, precisely. However, the diffusion coefficients will add. So the bias is bias-free. Sorry, the, the, the middle, the uh, uh, expectation value is bias-free, but the variance will grow quicker. So this is all very nice, and if we zoom out for just a second from the very simple pictures here, you can also generalize this to pretty much any general quantum channel you want to implement. In terms of operations that are implementable, that you can actually do, whether that's on one chip, two chips that are connected, they have LOCC or not. So you can take any class quantum channel, decompose it into operations you can do in terms of real co coefficients, and you can turn those into quasi-probabilities. And this is at least the way I'm starting to think of many of these techniques on the same footing whether it's probabilistic error cancellation, where you try to do a noise inverse, or it's circuit cutting or circuit knitting in terms of gates, where you want to implement a non-local gate across disconnected physical processors, or you're cutting wires, um, or you're perhaps doing a variety of classical simulation algorithms and you're trying to implement unitary. This is all very beautiful and nice, but why hasn't it really been implemented in practice so far? And that's because it critically hinges on knowing the full noise perfectly. And as you know, and as we've heard, this is very, very tricky and challenging. Um, I don't need to motivate to this audience that if you have 50 qubits, you need to then learn 10 to the 60 parameters for the noise. That's, that's 10 to the 50 gigabytes of classical RAM, which is not really feasible. On top of that, the noise parameters in these modern processors are actually relatively good. The numbers are at the level of 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 5. These are very small numbers that you then need to learn, so you can't do it with additive precision. You want to do it with multiplicative precision. And on top of that, you also need to learn the noise in, that includes crosstalk, correlated errors, you know, parallel gates. Um, so you need to find and handle this complexity in an efficient, scalable, accurate, and compact way. So how do you do that? So I'll tell you a little bit about the way that we've approached this in the second half of this talk by asking, is it really possible to learn the noise with accuracy, efficiency, and scalability in a large-scale modern quantum processor? Keep in mind, these machines are very complicated. You know, they're multi-chip, multi-layer. There's TSVs, bump bonds, uh, multi-level wiring. Uh, there's a lot going on. And there is no shortage of noise processes of all kinds, from energy relaxation to phasing, classical crosstalk, quantum crosstalk, measurement correlated errors, you know, flux noise, cosmic rays that, that my friends here are very concerned with, charge noise, etc. So somehow we need to be able to encompass knowledge of all of these different processes into and, and learn it efficiently. So step one is to simplify the noise. I think also John started with this in his talk. You can use begin by taking the noise that's a 4 to the n by 4 to the n matrix and using 
a technique known as twirling or randomized compiling. You can simplify that noise so that it's only, it only has four to the n number of parameters. If you're interested in a tutorial, you can scan this link. Essentially, you can guarantee that the noise in your quantum processor is a stochastic poly channel, where PA is a poly operator, CIA is some coefficient, and there's four to the n of these. The special thing about stochastic poly channels is that their eigenvectors are polys, and their eigenvalues are the polyfidelities. In step two, ideally what you want to do is leverage a lot of our knowledge on amplification and characterization of noise that we have so far, akin to randomized benchmarking, cycle RB, and so on. So ideally you take this noisy channel and repeat it many times. I think John also mentioned the Steve Flamia work. And you could just amplify the fidelity by repeating the circuit k times. And I'd love to be able to do this. Unfortunately, when you have an entangling gate, this no longer works directly. And this is a very beautiful paper from Liang Zheng, Sen Rui, and team that shows that there's a fundamental no-go theorem on learning here because of the entanglement of this uh, gate. So there's a lot of subtlety and beauty that goes into this. I'm going to skip over that, and although that was really the largest part of the project and the largest amount of time to figure out exactly how to do this. If you're interested, ask me in the question period. Let's just say that we developed some kind of custom protocol that's akin to cycle RB with some weak assumptions where you take a gate repeated many times and you can essentially extract all the parameters and more or less get away from this no-go theorem. We can then take as an example to see how this works a um, four qubit circuit just to begin with two parallel C knots and apply it on one of these realistic devices. And we can look as a function of the depth of how many times we've repeated this uh, pair of C knots going up to about a hundred times here, how the different expectation values measured all in the computational Z basis uh, decay. And you can also do this for just nine different bases. So from just nine different experiments, experiment classes, we can then find a number of decay curves. Each decay curve encodes a product of fidelities of the noise. So for instance, the blue teal curve here encodes, encodes the product of the ZIII fidelity times the ZII fidelity. That's a simple one because it's the same fidelity twice, so you can directly recover it from this. However, some of them encode um, more complicated things like, uh, you know, Z, X, Y, uh, let's see, ones that aren't the same, like I, Y, I, I, Z, Y, I, I, where things are a little bit more complicated because of this entanglement piece. In any case, from this, you can begin to reconstruct the full channel. The problem is that there are still four to the n number of curves, and we have a complete sampling over all possible combinations by doing just these nine experiments. However, there are still four to the n things. So this is going to be a problem when you want to scale. To resolve that, we're going to do a technique, I think Peter will also talk about a similar idea tomorrow, where you look at the generator of this channel, so we can look at what actually generates this channel by taking the logarithm of it, essentially the Louvillian or Limbladian. And we can, inf we can say because it's a physical process, it must be generated by a Limbladian type of construction. Because it's a stochastic poly channel, it must also be a poly, um, it must have this poly construction. And because we want to make a physical assumption of what this actually looks like, we're going to restrict our attention to just k-local terms, or terms that just represent the connectivity of the physical processor. In general, this, of course, has four to the n terms itself, but by doing this kind of restriction onto the actual topology of the physical processor, we can you know, just restrict ourselves to low-weight polys and just a few parameters. There's quite a bit of math that goes into this as well, as well as how you sample from this efficiently, how you invert this efficiently, and so on. I'm going to skip that and just call it some magic that you can read in the paper. But the important piece for us now 
is that we can, from that data set, directly reconstruct with very high accuracy, as I'll show you some validation later, the generators of this noise. So for this four qubit system, there are 256 polys we would have had to learn, but because we're looking at the generators, we can see that on qubit one, we have three possible errors that can be generated, X, Y, or Z. X and Y are almost the same. Z, of course, has the most probability to occur. Generally, the phasing is the worst. And then you can see that for our two body terms that generate noise, qubits one and four, which are coupled, have quite a bit of noise. Qubits four and seven, which don't have a gate between them, don't have that much noise. And qubits six and seven, which are having a C not applied to them, have quite a bit of noise. And in most cases, that noise is this ZZ interaction, which we expect from our physical modeling of the devices. So what, is, what does this actually tell me or tell us? I think of this as a fingerprint of the actual noise on the device. This fingerprint is unique and identical to that pair of C knots and gates that we applied. And we can also really look at, I forgot to emphasize, you know, this is at uh, 10 to the minus three. So these values are quite small, but we can do them in a, you know, just a couple of minutes of experimental runtime. We don't need 10 to the six shots to actually recover these. One application that you can ask me about if you're interested after when we get to the question period is how we can use this kind of fingerprint to then understand what various optimization techniques such as dynamical decoupling do to the device. So we can understand and measure how dynamical decoupling will affect all of these Z's and we can see the effect of how it tends to wash, uh, take them out, for instance. The next question is, what about going to larger systems, uh, to one of these systems? So this is now that same type of information and data on the generator plotted across a 20 qubit chain since we're interested in this 20 qubit Ising ring trotter layer, where we've applied, you know, one C naught between these two qubits, one and four, another C naught between seven and 10, so and so on. And each qubit has both local one body generators, so signified by these uh, rings, where you can see that the Z component, as shown in this legend, generally dominates. And we also recover the uh, two body terms as well between the qubits in this link. One important piece here is that the runtime of this algorithm doesn't scale with the number of qubits. It's the same, same number of circuits you run, same, same runtime. So as you scale to 100 qubits, let's say, it takes the same amount of data as to take the four qubit data and the 20 qubit data. Great. So maybe just I'll pause very quickly and check in if, if there's any questions on the learning piece before I move to using this to cancel noise. Um, uh, I don't quite understand. So the, uh, are you saying the Limbladian, so the, the, the log uh, L, um, is uh, it contains less number of parameters because uh, we know some kind of locality of the effect uh, uh, of the noise? Yeah, exactly. Is that an input or is that what you find out? <laughs> Good question. Um, in principle, it could be just as bad. It, there could be four to the n parameters. Luckily, that's not the case. We didn't know that when we set out to do the experiment. There was no evidence. We had some belief or suggestions. And uh, we, we um, ended up finding that that is, in fact, experimentally a very good model and fits the data very, very well. Um, and the way that the chips are designed, it makes sense that that type of model should work. Sometimes you can see a little bit of, of crosstalk between, um, oops, between, say, you know, qubit three and qubit ten, but it's very, very unlikely. And, and you know, everything we've done so far, that's not the limit. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I have a follow-up. Uh, so, in the instance where you had a fully, if you were to say create a fully connected uh, processor, would you recover that four to the n complexity then? Yeah. Great question. Uh, and in, if you had really a fully con connected processor, then you probably can't use this sparse representation as, as easily to gain in this number of parameters, because then presumably you have 
connectivity between everything and noise. But I don't know, maybe the noise is still local and not as two qubit, I'm not sure. I guess we'd have to see. Um, great, and maybe one last quick question from Elliot. Thank you. Uh, could you comment on the time scale over which these parameters change? Oh, yes. Thank you, Elliot. Great question. Um, all of this assumes so far that this noise is Markovian and that it doesn't change in time. Now, anybody who's played with superconducting qubits will tell you that that is not the case. Uh, so I, that, that was the first thing I spent you know, weeks on was running experiments where you just see how the noise runs over time and changes over time. In practice, what we will do is that we will interleave the learning with the mitigation on a, on a two hour schedule. So for about two hours, it's very stable. And then if you wait six hours, you know, it tends to drift a little bit. So at the two hour scale, it's, I would say it's very stable. Beyond that, you need to start interspersing learning with mitigation. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent, okay. So, so far we have learned the noise. Now we can try to uh, use that knowledge in order to then undo the noise that we have. So at a high level, to summarize the protocol, you give me some general circuit. You, we turn it into a layered decomposition of, of these kind of layers. These U's could be the same or different. For instance, in a Trotter simulation, there are only two different layers. We then do a benchmarking or a learning of all of the different noise layers. Each one, we take this kind of decaying exponential data, which we then sparsely fit onto a tomogram of the Limbladian. With that knowledge, uh, we then go back to run the circuit we actually want to run by also injecting these probabilistic gates to cancel the noise sampled from the quasi-probability distribution generated by this tomograms. And let's take an application to simulating the transverse field Ising model, time evolution. Um, we'll take this particular simple model and study the global magnetization across different length chains for this set of parameters. Uh, to make things concrete, for a, a small chain of four qubits, these are all the observables you want to measure to, to construct this magnetization. And these are the two layers of your trotterization that you want to simulate where you have essentially even C naughts and odd C naughts. First, we fingerprint these and find on a four qubit example, these following noise parameters. So 1.03 with an error bar of 10 to the minus four and 1.0384 with 10 to, it, they're pretty small numbers with very small error bars. So we, we're quite confident in them. In this idealizing model evolution, what you would see for the global magnetization is that ideally um, looking at the YZ block plane of the global magnetization, you should see this ideally spiraling in uh, spiral where you start at polarized in in this direction up here, and then you kind of spiral in towards the center over time. On the right here, I'll plot the relative Euclidean distance in this space between what we actually measure and what this ideal result is. So without probabilistic error cancellation, however, with every other technique available to us, so readout error mitigation, dynamical decoupling, uh, circuit optimization, et cetera, et cetera, the error that we see between the ideal curve and uh, the um, unmitigated curve or partially mitigated curve grows linearly with the number of trotter steps. And essentially, you know, even though it spirals in, that last point there should really be over here. So it's pretty far off by the time you're at 15 trotter steps. Once we add probabilistic error cancellation based on those noise tomograms we learned and sample a large number of circuits, then here we can recover the, uh, we can look at the ideal evolution versus the mitigated evolution, where the blue points are now the experimental data, the dashed line is the theory. And we can see that the relative Euclidean distance essentially stays very low or close to zero uh, and maybe slightly grows as you get to more trotter steps, 
although we could have reduced this by running more circuits, I believe. So if I want to then compare what happens in the presence of noise, where the air grows severely, versus in the presence of this particular mitigation technique with canceling the noise based on learning it, uh, we see a very significant improvement. And this is in effect that noise-free expect that this is in effect that a noise canceling headset taking out the red curve and turning it into a much quieter, nicer blue curve. This is very nice. That's just four qubits. Let's go to a slightly larger system. So now we can repeat the same thing on a 10 qubit system. This time, instead of looking at the global magnetization, I'd like to look at a much harder observable, and that is the all Z, the, the high weight poly observable, so all of weight 10. So here we can see what happens without uh, probabilistic air cancellation. The ideal curve should see revivals, shown by this dashed curves. And on the bottom, we see the air again grows as a function of, of the trotter step. And these are all the weight 9 observables. These are usually hard things to get. And if we add probabilistic air cancellation, we again uh, find that we're able to very well recover the, the noise-free value. So for me, this provides you know, very strong evidence that the, the validity of that sparse learning protocol and its time stability, to come back to that earlier question. So how does this all scale, and what is the error budget? If, this is an example now going up to 50 qubits. This is much more recent data, so it's a little preliminary, but I hope you, you won't blame me for showing it to you. Uh, the top curve shows us measurements of, uh, of for 50 qubits of two layers of CNOTs for different weight observables going from you know, single weight poly strings to Hamming weight 50 or the all Z observable. And you can see that as you go to higher weight observable, the unmitigated case, or I should say partially mitigated case, the error grows with the weight of the observable as you expect. And essentially over here, you've completely lost your signal. Uh, however, when you add in probabilistic error cancellation, we see that we're beginning to be able to recover those expectation values even all the way up to weight 50. Can you go to 100 qubits and, you know, trotter step 4,000 or 400? Um, you can begin to estimate the overhead for how many random circuits you would need to sample, how many quantum trajectories you have to ravel, and look at that as a function of how good your quantum processor is. Essentially, the better your fidelity of your gates, of your two qubit C naughts is, you get an exponential advantage in the number of circuits you need to run. So even a small change in the fidelity of your gate will lead to a giant reduction in the sampling overhead because of the, this exponential scaling. So in principle, if we could get the error rate to about, um, what, 2, 10 to the minus 4, and we could, at, at, a, at some reasonable rate, we, with one day of runtime, you could do 100 qubits with depth 400. At least that's, that's a hope. Uh, to come back to John Martinez's question, I, I was very inspired by your question, John, again. Is it useful to build a quantum computer with a few percent error? I'd like to hope so, and one way that I'm starting to think about this and to hopefully begin to answer yes, is to say that we can think of trading this classical sampling type of overhead, you know, yielding noise-free estimates, um, even though they exponentially scale, perhaps the overhead and uh, the way that they scale in terms of depth of the circuits and number of qubits in the system can still outperform classical computers or at least provide some kind of use. So with that, I'd like to summarize that we have this now uh, very nice Lambladian learning that is accurate, efficient, and scalable. We know that because we can use it to undo and mitigate the noise in these quantum circuits. It's quite handy as a benchmarking tool and as a characterization tool. Um, and uh, hopefully we can study some very cool physics with it. So with that, uh, thank you, and I'll take any questions you may have.
So my question is, um, how does this work with respect to um, um, coherent versus incoherent errors? You know, incoher coherent errors being calibration errors or crosstalk and incoherent being T1, T2 kind of things. Yeah, thank you, John. That's, that's a really great question. So uh, two ways. So the first step is that we tailor all of the coherent errors into incoherent errors with the twirling technique. So let me see where that slide is. It should be right here. So we take the, um, oops, how did we go all the way? That, so essentially, yes, you can take all of the coherent errors and turn them into incoherent errors with this polygates, which will then scramble all the phases of the coherence and yield incoherent errors on average. However, there is still a bit of a price to pay. You have to randomize more. You have to sample over more random uh, instances, uh, which is which is okay, uh, because we're anyhow sampling many, many random circuits. So I think it, I, I'm not too worried about them. Um, yes. Thanks for the really nice talk. Um, I think we may just miss something about the scalability here. So you said that currently you have to learn again every couple of hours, but then your mark was like it would take a day to, to learn. So what error rate do you actually need in order to do more computation than learning? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, even this data already takes more than two hours to run. So all the data I showed you actually took more than two hours. So the trick there is that uh, you, can, um, you can learn, mitigate, learn, mitigate, learn, mitigate. So you can interleave your learning with your, correct, with your uh, mitigation. And when you average over this broader ensemble, you still end up with the unbiased expectation value. So it's okay, in other words. But this was the biggest thing that I was worried about personally when, when, when I started this and took a lot of data that looked concerning at first, but it ended up working out. I think, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I'm sure this, I think this was in your final few slides, but I, I didn't extract it correctly. In terms of the scaling of your variance, both separately with depth and number of qubit, what, what is that scaling? Is it exponential in both of those parameters or? Um... Yeah, thank you. So here's an extra backup slide. Uh, well, it's part of the full one hour talk, but um, the number of uh, samples or circuits you need to run uh, is roughly, proportional. you know, there's some like spectral norm of the observable and this and that, but, but basically it ends up being this. So it's gamma, uh, which is the uh, strength of the um, the noise, which you can see plotted here versus number of qubits for the two trotter layers uh, around the ring. Um, so it, it's, it, that part grows slowly, although a small change here will lead to an exponential overhead eventually. And uh, epsilon, of course, is, you know, your error tolerance. But there's no, no dependence of this on the number of qubits or the depth? Right. So, sorry, this is the number of qubits. There's no dependence on the depth? Uh, uh, oh, uh, so yes, so the, you would, they, they multiply together. Uh, so the, the, if you want the um, total gamma factor of the entire circuit is the product of all the gamma factors of the individual I see. So, so it does grow exponentially in depth, but nicely in, in number of qubits or something. Yes, exactly. And this, uh, this relationship here summarizes that. So it's gamma bar, which is the average, if you want, it's not, it's not the average, but it's effectively like your average value of the quantum noise per qubit. Average in this kind of logarithmic sense. Uh, to the power of the number of qubits times the depth um, that, uh, you know, weighted by, so the actual runtime then depends on how many layers you have, because the more layers you have, the longer you need to run. And beta is this factor that tells you how fast you can actually do operations, which we call the CLOPS or cycle layer operations per second. And so this is the estimate for your runtime. Great, thanks. Which you can compare, I guess, to classical algorithms. I just wanted to ask about noise mitigation and mid-circuit measurements. <laughs> 
the question, so the question is, how about doing this in mid-circuit measurements? Yeah. It's a great question. I have asked that myself. We haven't done it yet. It's an open question. Thanks. Um, how, so I know that the calibration process is generally for most processors uh, are quite time consuming. What's the, so you showed this plot of like uh, you get an exponential increase in the fidelity as a function of decreasing your uh, gate error. Um, what's the trade-off in terms of deploying something like this versus just doing calibration procedures to get higher fidelities in your fundamental operations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I suppose, yeah, one can think about that definitely, and I think it's it's a it's very interesting to see. Usually, those calibrations, you know, you're air amplifying some C naught or some F swap where where you applied many many times. So there's some similarity to that here. In those, usually you're focused on one or two particular parameters. Of you assume you have an over rotation or a phase angle and you're trying to amplify a specific error. Here, we're really trying to capture the general error. The other thing is that here, we're twirling noise, whereas in general, you you know, you know may twirl or you may not want to twirl. So it's, um, I guess the answer maybe in short is that maybe it's something to look at. Uh, I, I I don't know yet. Uh, it, might, it might be okay, but I think it would take a little longer because it's, it's a more general protocol as opposed to a special tailored one. Yep. Um, One final question. We yes. have, uh, it's so hard to find slides here. <laughs> yeah, I was just curious when you showed the um, two qubit errors, uh, the correlated errors, uh, there was some asymmetry between uh, x, y, let's say, and y, x. Does that come from the way you do the cross resonance gates that there is? An asymmetry there, or an equivalent lattice size, or something else? Yeah, that's. This is a great question. So maybe that's a good time to show you two a couple of hidden slides. Um, so imagine we take a larger circuit uh, that looks like this, and this is now our layer, and we run some. We run this exact procedure on it. So in without dynamical decoupling on zero, seven, and fifteen. What you then see is that the Lindbladian tomography tells you that the dominant noise sources of error are all Z errors. Because, you know, you have idle times here. I think John also said this, leaving a qubit alone is one of the worst things you can do. And so you have this tremendous, you know, look at qubit 7, which you're not doing anything to. You have spectator errors and idle errors, and dominant ones are Z, right? And that's because T2, the phasing, just tends to be the worst for various reasons. The two qubit errors otherwise are not so bad. What you can then do is say, oh, that's my dominant error. Let me find the right technique to go and try to fix that. So if you now add in some, you know, XY or XY4 dynamical decoupling, you can then repeat the same learning with that dynamical decoupling in place. And you can take the same tomogram on the same scale. And you notice that we've now managed to kill off all of those dominant Z contributions from you know, 0, 7, and 15. Otherwise, the tomogram remained relatively the same. Um, so this way, you can begin to identify what's my dominant noise mechanism and what technique should I try to use to, to attack it with. If you look closer here, lots of ZZ. That's because we have ZZ coupling on these IBM machines. You also notice that there's a bunch of ZX or ZX variants, which are also due to the nature of the cross-residence generation. So it, it kind of lines up with the physical models of the, of the noise. Okay, well, thank you very much to both speakers. Thank you.